people don't realize, like, you, you know, I remember putting my, my health at risk. You'd feel like the next day, like, I got, like, whooping cough. Or I think I got, like, asthma. I got a black thing in my lung. I can feel it. I cough. It's like, the f*** are you doing, man? You're like, but it's worth it. But it's worth it. I got this f***ing rare, you know, Lynn Collins 45, ah, whatever. <laughs> What's up? This is Z Trip. Uh, chilling here. You're checking out Crate Diggers. I kind of stopped uh, counting at one point because it was like it just it, trying to keep a tally in my mind of everything I had. Is, I just sort of gave up. But um, last I checked, I have about 25, 30,000 records here. I probably have about the same or a little more in storage. That's what you would do as a digger, as a, you know, collecting music. It was tough, man. I, I lost a lot of girlfriends to this shit. Because, you know, we would go on vacation somewhere and it'd be like, you know, the plan might have been to like go to a park and then go to dinner and then go to a movie. And before I knew it, it was like, go to the, gotta go to the record store. And she knew, like, this is how I make my money. Don't, you can't, like, when the opportunity, when it falls in your lap, you have to go. And so I would go digging and, you know, for the first hour or so, you know, you'd be like, hopefully I can get through, like, all these crates. But then after, like, two hours, three hours, because you had to, like... I'm only here, we're only here this one time, it's open, I'm here, I'm finding this stuff, and um, I remember pulling out like amazing records out of some of these places, but you know, losing a lot of relationships to it. But that's just what you had to do, man, you know, that was the gig. This one is, uh, is one that I found super, super rare. It's uh, Radio and Easy Does It by Easy e but it's the acetate, so it's the, you know, when they would do, when they would record something, um, they would press an acetate of it, which might be like, you know, hey, let's listen to what we did today in the studio and take it home and listen to it. So it's sort of like a test press, um, and it's made out of uh, acetate, which is why they call it acetate. But um, so it's it's a if you listen to it, it's kind of tinty and it's funky, and you can only really play a couple a couple times before it really sounds like. Shit. But um, I've only played it a couple times. But you know, April fourth, nineteen eighty eight, uh, Ruthless Records, twelve inch. Um, you know, these are the things you find when you really are digging out there and you, you stop and you, <laughs> you lose the girlfriend. You find that kind of shit. The way I have it organized, um, for me, I found it always easier for all the stuff that I was using in shows to have it all BPM'd. Everything sort of starts at like 70 beats per minute. And you know, there's a couple things that are like slow jams or whatever that are like in the 60s, but everything's 70 and goes up faster, 70, 71, 72 and on. And it goes all the way like that, all the way around till you get to like the 135 one, whatever, which is on that. It's like it just wraps around the whole thing. But um, the thing is once you sort of get to like 138 and it's sort of double time, it sort of goes back to 70. So it's sort of one of those things where if it was like a really up-tempo 70, I'd throw it there. If it was a real slow 138, I'd throw it kind of there. But it's interesting because it all comes back around. Let's try to find a record that makes sense. Let me find something that... All right, oh, here we go. Uh, MC 900 Foot Jesus, uh, going straight to heaven. This was, this dude, I loved his stuff, and DJ Zero was pretty dope, but uh, he had a song called While the City Sleeps that was one of my favorites, but Network Records did a lot of industrial stuff, and these guys were sort of hybrid, sort of industrial um, hip-hop, and uh, yeah, man, I dug this stuff. Really, really interesting dude. I lived in Little Neck um, growing up, and so, and then my parents moved to Arizona. They got a divorce, and my dad moved back, so then I was back and forth between New York and Arizona, so... It's kind of interesting. I got my fix and my ear for hip hop um, in New York, listening to BLS and Kiss, Mr. Magic, Marley Mall, Red Alert, um, and then brought all that music to Arizona where nobody knew any of that stuff. So I'd buy these records in New York and I'd come back home and I'd play them. People would be like, what the f is that? It's, oh, it's EPMD. Who, who what? What? I don't, you know. I got a job working at a gas station, would, you know, get money and go and buy comics and records and play video games and just was absorbed into that and just paying attention to what was going on around me. but. Always into music, always buying music, always had a Walkman, always had cassettes, always taping things. Um, after a while, you know, anytime I could fly back to New York, um, it was to see family, but really it was secretly to get records. It was great because I'd go there and I'd just bring it all back. I remember, you know, spending, I think the first time I got a credit card, I maxed it out to like 500 bucks buying records, and I was like, 
it, I need all, like, I need this. And, you know, after, then you start buying doubles because you get it, like, after a while, and you start buying all this stuff. And then it was like, I got home, and I'm like, I got all this music. I'm like, how the f am I going to pay for this? So, but, um, you know, after a while, just the collection grew, and, and I was able to do house parties, and then ended up doing um, school dances and weddings and, you know, whatever I could do to make money doing this to fund it. But it, it was, uh, it was, that's kind of how it started. I remember the first record I bought was um, Star Wars. It was the story to Star Wars. Um, marked up for show purposes. <laughs> Had the whole thing, you know, as a kid, this was, this was major. That movie changed my life. And when I saw the record, I was like, in the store, I was like, I, I need to own this. And I took it home and I listened to it. I saw the movie in my head, you know, it was like one of those things where it's like old time where you turn on the radio and you know, you'd have to visualize. I listened to it backwards and forwards. And um, to this day, I could recite the whole thing because I listened to it so many times, you know what I mean? And um, from time to time, I'll still throw little bits and pieces of it into a mix just, just cause. This is really starting to get into really cool stuff. Uh, test press, a show vinyl that Shadow did, basically his show vinyl that had all the parts separated. So this is really something that's like specific that only he would have, or I would have, or the people that remixed his, his stuff would have. Mixmaster Mike actually gave me this one. This is basically the instrumentals to, um, to all the songs, the Beastie Boys songs. Um, anytime you're talking about show vinyl from back in the day, or you come across it if you're digging around, it's, um, you know, as an artist, you'd press up your show vinyl to actually be specific to your show, so you wouldn't have to like bring a crate of records with all the breaks, you just press them up, but this is like, all their instrumentals and all their breaks and things that they would use at the show. I like to buy and I would always like to play really bizarre and different records. Anything that was off the beaten path of what everybody else was playing. So I found this um, Cookie Monster C is for Cookie 12 inch that Larry Levan um, produced, um, not produced, but remixed. But um, And so I only had one and there's this really interesting sort of like conga breakdown, disco breakdown, and I only had one, and it's not a record that you'd really play the whole thing to get to the break, because it's really like, oh, it's C's for cookie, then you need the break. You can't be like, C is for cookie, C is for cookie, C is for cookie for like three minutes before this drum break, because people would look at you like, what are you crazy? So I wanted to get another one so I could actually just sort of be like, oh, that's so funny, and drum break, keep dancing, keep moving, but it was a really hard 12 inch to find, so I found my second one in Japan, and I think I paid like 75 bucks for it. Um, and that's pretty much the most I would pay for a record. This one uh, from Common, this is back in, uh, what was this, 94? Uh, I'll read it to you, it says, uh, to Z Trip, what up brah? You got skills on the one and two? Keep it flowing. Common, Chicago. Just kind of cool, like a little sign of the times because he and I have the same lawyer now. My thing is, I, I was sort of the king of the dollar records, man, you know? When everybody would go into the record store, I remember going and shopping with like Shadow and Cut Chemist and Newmark and, and these guys and, and we'd all, uh, you know, we'd all go into the record store at the same time and those guys would always sort of gravitate towards one section and I thought that was dope because they were all like trying to find these records but meanwhile I was like, there's no way I can compete with these dudes. They're, they're deeper in their funk and their jazz than I am um, I'm gonna go to the rock section, or I'm gonna go to the kids section, or I'm gonna go to like the spoken word section. Anywhere they're not, that's where I'm gonna be. And I would come up and find the craziest shit. And then we'd all compare stuff at the end of the day, and you know, they'd be playing me these um, tremendous breaks that were just like amazing, these 45s that were just burners that I was like, I'll never find that, especially with you being in the store. No way I would find it. But check out this record I got from, you know, Trinidad with a steel drum break. It's like, and people are like, whoa, I'm like, yeah, that's right. While you were over there, I was over here and I found some really bizarre shit. This is one that I found um, and I used it on my Live in LA CD and it was uh, Sesame Street Born to Add. And um, there's a, a version that they did of Barry White and it's called Me Going to Munch You, Munch You, Munch You and it was Cookie Monster doing it. It was the um, I'm Gonna Love You a Little More is the Barry White joint with a break on it. And uh, I remember uh, I ended up opening up for The Roots um, a while back and uh, Questlove comes walking into the building and I'm setting up, he's like, yo, that CD, man, amazing. I was like, yo, thank you. Like, you know, big fan of his stuff. 
he, he hit me up and he was like, dude, what is that, what is that version, the Muppets version of that song? I'm like, dude, I got you. And uh, I, he could never find it, so I ended up sending him an MP3 of it, and uh, it was from this one. And it was, that was sort of the, the moment where I was like, oh, I got Questlove validation on some Sesame Street shit. Oh, shit. yeah, actually, it was when Amoeba Records opened in San Francisco. Um, I had all these records that I had already owned, and a lot of them were like rock records and rock breaks. I, I knew my rock records left and right from my brother growing up. Um, but some of them were just dusted, you know, you'd beat the shit out of double copies. So I remember uh, going to San Francisco, and my friend's like, yo, check out this new store. It's called Amoeba. They just opened. They've got so many records. I walk in, it's like this old bowling alley, right, filled with records. I was like, Jesus Christ. Ah, I lost my mind. I went in there and all their records, they had like premium records up top, but then there was like all the the basic records, like the rock records and the, you know, whatever, all a dollar. And I was like, ah. Oh. So I just lost my mind and I think I spent like a thousand bucks or 1200 bucks, but like I cleaned up on every single record that I ever needed a double of or new copies of, or if I had a warped one, I was like, Fuck it, it's a do like I didn't even think. It was like, oh yeah, that just put throw in the bag. Before I knew it, I had, you know, whatever, eight or nine crates of records, or, or boxes, and not crates, but boxes, and I was like, how am I gonna get these home? And I flew home and I basically had to bring them all to Southwest and I was like, there's you could only have X amount of bags at the time, and I was like, look. Uh, just get like my crack fiend with the music. I'm like, uh, you know, I try to explain it to the chick and, you know, thank God she, she's, you know, there was, she was cool and she ended up charging me like 50 bucks or something, but she was like, really? And I'm like, yeah, you know, so I ended up like having like 10 bags or something. <laughs> oh, this is a great record. This is a really dope record. DJ Jell and Mr. Dibbs did a, a record about like secret societies and and um, Illuminati and that kind of stuff. And Doze did the cover. And um, Future Primitive put it out. I was always trying to, to take two worlds and combine them. Um, complete visionary, way ahead of his time. Uh, had a little bit of time on the business side, but as a visionary, way ahead of his time. Um, and this is one of the records. This is a really rare record, actually. Um, I need to listen to this again. It's amazing. But Doze did all the artwork, and Doze, like, you know, Skull and Bones, like the CIA, FBI, the Masons, like all the, like really, really heavy, heady sort of conspiracy record, but like definitely one that you, you want to check out. This one was huge, huge movie for me. Uh, this was also on, on Uneasy Listening, for those of you who know. A friend of mine was friends with Barry Dvorzen, the guy who created the theme for The Warriors, um, and he played him uh, the mix that I did um, from Uneasy Listening, and I was my pants thinking he was just gonna like lose his mind and be like what is this and hate it but he actually loved it and uh uh to zach it was great meeting you barry divorce and big big record big movie huge influence yeah escape from new york um i have three copies of this right here this movie was amazing at the time when it came out here's john carpenter and um alan howarth in the studio and if you look around at all the synth gear they have they were making this music and this music is so like it was so apocalyptic and moody and crazy and uh you know at the time i mean look at all the instruments prophet five arps they use roland sequencers uh, lindrums you know like basses and for the time this was really really over the top electronic record and uh the 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 movie was equally as amazing uh, what was not amazing was Escape from L.A., which was shit. You know, The bigger your collection, the bigger your palette, the more you could say, the more you could choose from. And um, I, I recognized that early on. The best thing is doing a club or doing a show, uh, and, you know, the crowd loves it and everyone digs it, but the best thing is when you're packing up, you know what I mean? Everyone's left and they've kicked everyone out, and the random door guy or whatever comes up and is like, yo, man. I listened to a lot of motherfuckers play here. That was dope. I liked what you did. Or the bartender's like, yo, that was amazing. Or like the person who's like, you know, jaded as fuck. He's there every night, listens to it all, hates it all. He really hates music. Hates fucking everything, hates his life. Comes up and is like, yo, that was dope. <laughs>
Yeah, it was a, it was a spot in like, uh, it was like Santa Fe or some shit. It was like an ice cream parlor slash record store. They, I ended up just going in there and like, my friend was like, yo, this is great digging here. But you dig and you also like, oh, I can get a, like a, an, ice cream, right? an ice cream too, so. <laughs>